everyone, my name is Tammy Doe and I'm with the Dash Solutions team at Plotly. In the next eight minutes, I'm going to walk you through how to take an interactive Dash app and scale it up to analyze big data sets by leveraging Databricks behind the scenes using the Databricks SQL Python connector. The sample Dash app that I'll be using in this video was made using only open source Dash components and the data set is a sample accessible to any Databricks customer. So if you don't have your own Dash app or data set, feel free to use these to follow along. Links to the code base in GitHub, the deployed app to play around with, and a recent Medium article describing the connector and how to use it can be found in the description below. Before we get into this step-by-step, -step, you might be wondering if this is the right approach for you. So let's talk advantages for integrating your Dash app with Databricks. Dash apps are a great way to visualize your data and incorporate user interactivity, where the click of a button or the sliding of a scale changes the data being shown. Behind the scenes, you might be using something like Pandas and Python to do the user-triggered data analysis for these views. That's fine for computationally simple analysis or smaller data sets, but you'll start to notice that as you get more complex or expand your data set to millions of rows, that's going to slow down your app and take away from the user experience. This is where Databricks comes in. Using Databricks for storing those millions of rows and connecting to a SQL warehouse cluster allows you to run computationally intensive SQL queries on the Databricks SQL Photon engine. Running and retrieving the results of these queries in real time is a high-speed option to update the data used in your Dash app visualizations. So let's get started. First, we'll get ourselves a data set loaded into Databricks, and for that, we'll log into the Databricks workspace with Databricks SQL enabled. If you have your own data set you want to use, I won't walk through this now, but to get set up, you just need to create a SQL data warehouse and then a table. Both of these can be done by going into Databricks SQL clicking the Create button on the side menu, and configuring those two things to suit your dataset and computing needs. A link to the Databricks SQL documentation can also be found in the description below. For this demo, everything we need is contained in the GitHub repository I mentioned earlier. So we'll go ahead and clone that to our Databricks workspace by going to the Data Science and Engineering tab, clicking on Repos. If you don't see the Repos button, don't panic. That just means you need to enable it in your admin console and we'll go ahead and click Add Repo, paste the link that's in the description, and hit Create. The Databricks notebook we want is under the Utils folder, and it's called Build Backend IoT Database. You'll just want to hit the Run All Cells button. I won't now since I've already done this, but essentially it creates the SQL Data Warehouse and Table using a sample data set shipped with Databricks. After that runs, we can confirm we now have the right tables by going back to Databricks SQL and opening the Data tab. There should be a database called Plotly IoT Dashboard, which contains these four tables, two sensor tables and two user tables. This dataset mimics a research study scenario where you track the fitness metrics of a group of participants using wearable sensors. So the sensor tables show metrics measured like calories burned or number of steps, and the user tables contain the demographic data of all the users. The bronze tables are the raw data files, and the Databricks notebook has done some cleaning on them and put the refined data into the silver tables. So now that we have a data set stored in Databricks, we can go to our Dash app and get to connecting our app to our data. If you have your own Dash app, you can open that up in your local IDE, wherever you've been coding that up. Uh, I'm using VS Code. I think it's really clean looking because it auto formats using black, but whatever IDE you use is fine. Um, if you're following along with our sample app, you'll just need to clone the repository to your local machine and open that up in your IDE. Um, we've put all the packages you'll need to run the app in the requirements.txt file, so you'll want to open up your terminal and install those on your environment. Uh, again, I'm using a virtual environment so that these dependencies are kept separate from my other projects, but if you have nothing else going on, feel free to just install them on your base environment. We also recommend using Python 3.8 for your environment as outlined in the runtime.txt file. The final piece of configuration for the connection is to create a .end file to get the app to point to your own Databricks cluster and authenticate using your personal access token. We can find these by going back to Databricks, uh, clicking on the cluster we've created, and going to the connection details tab. You can then create a personal access token for authentication here. Now that we're all set up, let's take a look at the app and walk through how we're connecting to Databricks and how the queries are formatted and run on the Databricks SQL warehouse. We can run the app locally by running the app.py file, and I'll just put the app and code side by side here. 
So you can see we have two tabs. Uh, on this tab, we have graphs showing information about the whole group of participants, and the other tab shows individual participant metrics. Each tab has tons of buttons that all trigger queries to Databricks SQL using dash callbacks. And at the top, we have filters you can choose from to determine what the comparison category should be. So for example, right now, we're looking at the data broken down by participant sex, but we could instead compare the data for participants who had normal blood pressure versus high blood pressure. When I click that button, all the graphs on this page were updated via these three callbacks, one for each graph, and the comparison input variable was passed to the functions that run the queries and retrieve the results from Databricks. If I go to any one of these functions, we can see how that works using the Databricks SQL connector. So you can see at the top of the page, we've imported the environment variables we set earlier, along with the database and table names, which will be the same for you if you're using uh, the sample data set, or you can set them to whatever database and tables you're connecting to. This one package we import at the top is the Databricks SQL connector for Python. And you can see that in each of these functions, we first set a connection variable and then use it to execute a SQL query passed in as a string. The variables set by the user input on the app are passed into the function to customize the query statements, and the return data frame is used to create the visualization. You can see that some of these queries are more basic, just applying filters to the data set and returning the filtered data, whereas other queries are more complicated, uh, summing data, grouping by categories, joining the user and sensor tables, limiting the range of the data, etc. Um, an extra thing to note here, we haven't used it in this app, but another connection method for running SQL queries on Databricks is through SQL Alchemy by using the SQL Alchemy Databricks Python package and running queries with an ORM. The Medium article that is linked below in the description contains a code snippet showing how to use that method if you're interested in learning more. Back to the app, we've configured notifications to trigger that tell you how many queries were run and how much data was retrieved to update the graphs. Uh, whenever the user inputs are changed. For context, there are a million rows in the sensor table and 38 unique participants. And each time I trigger a query, it runs and loads new visualizations within seconds. And finally, datasets generally aren't static. You might have a dataset that gets updated daily, hourly, or even every couple seconds. In that case, you wouldn't want to manually trigger a data refresh by clicking a button. Instead, you could incorporate the dash interval component, which regularly performs an action on a specified time interval. In this sample data set, the data isn't changing, so to demonstrate this functionality, you might have noticed that we have the time displayed in the bottom left corner. In the code, this is being done by the first callback in our app.py file, where we have the interval component set to one second, and the action that's performed on that interval is returning the current time formatted to show only the minutes and seconds. If you had a changing data set, the action could instead be a query of the data in its current state, set to an appropriate time interval for repetition. For more information, check out the links in the description below, and thanks for watching.